today some more Adventist terminology. Don't you just love it? No, this is not Adventist terminology. I'm sorry. The early and the latter rain. Those are Bible ideas, right? They're mentioned in the Bible. What about the latter rain? <clears throat> There's been a lot of question about the latter rain. Uh, what happens when it falls? Or is it falling now? Some have thought so. What with such wonderful happenings in third world countries, there are places where they're, they're baptizing hundreds of people at once. We just have two here today, right? It seems that in America, we don't have the number of baptisms they are having in other places like Brazil and inner America and those places. But wonderful happenings. Do these answer to the latter rain? Um, <clears throat> the expression early rain and latter rain are mentioned in the book of Joel as happening very close together. The Latter, the former rain and then followed in the same month by the latter rain. In the end time, things speed up a little bit. So uh, <clears throat> what do these expressions mean? Early rain and latter rain are expressions in the Bible to denote the Holy Spirit coming to God's people. And uh, they're borrowed from Old Testament agrarian Palestinian economy of symbols of the Holy Spirit agrarian, farming. The early rain fell in Palestine to germinate the seed and bring the tender grain to the, uh, through the soil. And Jesus said, first the blade and then the ear, and then the full corn in the ear, okay? Former rain. Then the latter rain, falling near the close of the growing season, was designed to bring maturity to the grain. At that time, moisture and heat Change the kernels of grain from the dough stage to a hardened grain, ready to be harvested. So the former and latter rain denote God's input into the lives of people, bringing them to a knowledge of the truth and also into conversion and sanctification and ready for Jesus to come. Early and latter rain. These symbols of the Holy Spirit are the Bible explanation of how the new birth, the new life in Christ, Christian growth, and maturity begin to take place. And then the harvest of the world. Jesus once said the harvest is what? The end of the world. Jesus said this gospel of the kingdom must be preached in all the world for a witness to all nations. And then what happens? Then the end will come. People don't like to hear the word end. But you know it's the beginning of something great, right? How many of you want to go to heaven? Yeah. How many of you want, to, want, want Jesus to come if you're not ready? Oh, no hands, right? <laughs> That's going to be a bad day. I'd like to have you turn your Bibles with me to Luke chapter 24. It was your scripture reading this morning. Luke 24, 49 to 53. Luke 24, 49 to 53. Here's what it says. Luke 24, 49. And behold, I send the promise of my Father upon you. But tarry you in the city of Jerusalem until you be endued with power from where? On high. And he led them out as far as to his Bethany. He lifted up his hands and blessed them. And it came to pass while he blessed them, he parted from them and was carried up into heaven. Talks about that in Acts chapter 1. And they worshipped him and returned to Jerusalem with what? great joy. Christianity is a great joy. Becoming a part of God's family is a great joy. In thy presence is the fullness of joy. At thy right hand are what? Pleasures forevermore. And they, con were, con and they were, and were continually in the temple praising God. So uh, <clears throat> he said, Terry, in Jerusalem, the early church really began in the upper room. And uh, over the next few days, with 120 people gathered there. The story is recorded in Acts chapter 1 uh, and onward. And when Pentecost came, the early rain fell. Now, I'm going to use that expression, the early rain fell, several times this morning. Because it applies to us as much today as it did back there in the first century. 
they were all united. There was like a mighty rushing wind, rushing wind, and the curtains uh, shook, and the Holy Spirit filled the house where they were waiting. Acts 2 verse 3 says, There appeared unto them cloven tongues like as a fire, and it sat upon each of them. Fire, power from on high. That's what he promised them. And verse 4 says they were all filled with the Holy Ghost. The Bible says they turned the world upside down. And they were accused of filling Jerusalem with their doctrines. What doctrines really were those? Where did the apostles get those doctrines from? They got them from Jesus, right? They got them firsthand. He's the one that established this church. And they continued in the apostles' doctrine, and they were added to the church, and so forth and so on, clear to the end of chapter 2, the great Pentecostal sermon of Peter. All this without television, without uh, computers, without live streaming, without airplanes, without modern modes of, modes of travel, in a mere 30 years, plus or minus, they carried the gospel to the then known world. They wore out their shoes, literally, going from place to place, talking to people. They went where the people were. And uh, they, they carried the gospel around the civilized and inhabited world. In Colossians 1.23, it says that the gospel went to every creature under heaven. 30 years, plus or minus. Wow. Wow. They did that, and they did. And what can happen when the former reign of the Holy Spirit is given to us with that kind of power? Former reign now. We're not talking latter reign yet. They had the former reign, right? What we all need is a daily upper room experience. Have you been in an airport sometime or in other public places, and just see the, 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 the sheer volume of people. I was in Las Vegas one time, and Coral and I, and we were standing on a street corner, and the people were just throngs of people moving down the street, walking down the street. Uh, I watched the faces of some of these people, and they weren't very happy. Maybe some of them had lost money gambling. Who knows? But they were talking. They had their cell phones. And they were walking this way and that way, phones in their hands, in their ears, blackberries and blueberries, and then all kinds of berries and modern communication, and they were just walking along. And you go to a big place like the great freeways in, in Los Angeles and other places, and you see the cars one after the other. Some of them are parked in the, par in the middle of the freeway, and all these people. How are they all going to be reached? And their attention is fo focused on exciting worldly things. And you wonder, how will they all ever be reached? And I believe they will. Be reached by, perhaps by some of the most simple ways of, uh, of communication. You know, God has given us an open book. Daniel is unsealed. Jesus literally shines through that book. It tells about Jesus in the heavenly sanctuary. And uh, God gives his people secrets that unlock the book of Revelation. Revelation is an open book. It's the revelation of Jesus Christ. There are open books for us, both of them. They're end time books. And we've been told that when we better understand the books of, Revel of, books of Daniel and Revelation, we'll have an entirely different religious experience. How many of you want a different religious experience, a deeper one, a better one than you have today? Daniel and Revelation are designed to do that. It's called in 2 Thessalonians, developing a love for the truth. And when we develop a love for the truth, guess what happens? We are shielded from deceptions. The deceptions of the last days that Jesus talks so much about in Matthew 24. That's the world that we have been called upon to minister to. And the Holy Spirit always accompanies a love for the truth. Holy Spirit, form of rain we're talking here. Laodicea, that's almost become a bad word. <laughs> we talk about Laodicea. Sometimes we associate that word with uh, 
kind of a word like Pharisee or hypocrite, maybe. It's been associated with a sleepy church, maybe a lukewarm church, but that's not the meaning of the word at all. The word means a people who are judged. We're living in the judgment hour versus history, right? Jesus is in the most holy place, and he is doing a closing work. And so these are a people who live during the judgment hour. How many of us are living during the judgment hour? All of us are. An end time people, a final generation people. The hour of his judgment has come. And that's what the first angel cries in the midst of the heavens with great power. Now, it's true that the seventh church in Revelation is Laodicea. And uh, something has happened to us. Perhaps we've lost our first love. You think that might could happen? You know what happened in the first church? First church was what church? Ephesus, right? The first of the seven churches. The first church was Ephesus. And uh, so uh, guess what? They lost their first love. Maybe we should study the Ephesus message too. They lost that first love while they were trying to uphold the truth all the time because there were a lot of, a lot of errors creeping into the church even, even at the end of the first century. So they lost their love for Jesus while trying to uphold truth. Could that happen to us? It could happen, couldn't it? Perhaps we've lost our first love. That's what lukewarm is. And Jesus counseled us to buy what? Gold that's tried in the fire, the gold of faith and love. He counseled us to buy the white raiment and the eye salve. Maybe we should look at that first church and see what happened to them, okay? So Jesus said, tarry here till you receive power. So they went into the upper room. There were 120 of them in that room. And when Jesus went back to the heavenly sanctuary, it was, it was to be anointed as our high priest, and something happened on heaven. And something, that happened in heaven while something was very important was happening on earth. The, latter, the former rain fell upon the people in that upper room. And those 120 in that upper room were in one accord. There was complete unity among them. And the Holy Spirit fell on them all. And fire is a symbol of power. And the fire fell. And the Holy Spirit did for them in a moment what they could never have accomplished in a whole lifetime. That's how yielded they were. And they could speak with accuracy the language of the one next to them that they were ministering to. And they had that gift for life as they ministered to people around the Mediterranean Rim. Interesting. At Babel, God confused the languages, didn't he? He stopped all the craziness that was taking place at that point. And at Pentecost, he empowered his servants to speak those languages and take away the confusion and the, and the craziness that was going on. Just the opposite took place on the day of Pentecost. And we're told that the closing work, when I say closing work, what do I mean? The work in which we're involved with, right? in carrying the gospel to people. We are told that the closing work will not be finished with less power than when it started. And the starting work was at Pentecost, and that was early rain power. Do you think that we still have access to that? Oh, yes. We can at very least expect at very least expect what the apostles expected and what they experienced. I'd like to read an incident from Acts chapter 3. Acts chapter 3. Now I want to read verses 6 to 10. A very interesting happening took place. Acts chapter 3, verses 6 to 10. Now here's what it says. Then Peter said, Silver and gold have I none, but such as I give, such as I have, give I to you. In the name of Jesus of Nazareth, rise up and walk. Miracle performed right there at the gate. Beautiful. And he, and he took him by the right hand, lifted him up, and immediately he, his feet and ankles received strength. And he, leaping up, stood and walked and entered with them into the temple, walking and leaping and praising God. And all the people saw him walking 
and praising God. And they knew that it was he which sat for alms at, at the beautiful gate of the temple. And they were filled with wonder and amazement at that which had happened to him. The man was a familiar, was a familiar sight in that, in that place. His friends no doubt carried him to this place every day, gate beautiful, Jerusalem. For years they saw him there with his little bucket, holding it out for, for, for sustenance. And as the people passed through the, that gate, everyone knew him. And then Peter come by, came by and filled with the former rain. There it is. Peter said, you know, Peter, what a change came over him from his days before the crucifixion. Here he was now, and he was filled with the Spirit and working miracles. He sold his boat, he sold his fishing nets, and went fishing for people. Like pioneer Adventists, they sold often what they had, bought paper, paid printing bills, and um, literature filled the, the towns where they, where they were ministering. That's commitment. That's dedication. That's early reign power. So Peter didn't have silver and gold anymore, but he said the word and the poor man leaps up and praises God. You know, it's, there's nothing wrong with having a little bit of emotion. Do you think that's right? There's nothing wrong with having. He leapt for joy. Who wouldn't? He'd been this way from his birth. And uh, that's such a wonderful thing. And when our focus is on Christ, we are excited and we can praise him from our hearts. A lack of this kind of excitement for souls may be a symptom of lukewarmness, right? Laodiceanism. Could that happen? At the gate, beautiful where Peter was, and uh, these things happened. Prob probably 5,000 or more people saw that happen. And they wondered at Peter, what he had done for this man. The physicians could not help him. The priests could not help him. And probably jealousies arose. And Peter was told, you've got to stop this. Don't do this anymore, okay? Can you imagine a thing like that? Don't do this anymore. What do you think would happen if thousands, even millions of Sabbath keepers began to heal people and speak clearly our message penetratingly to people? That's former rain. It's going to happen. The world, this world would turn upside down again, and when that happens, they'll ask you to stop too. Where that's ahead of us, like they did with Peter. And then Peter's arrested, and he goes to prison. Then he's released by angels. And uh, that's the early reign of the Holy Spirit. 3,000 were baptized that first day. What was the cause of all this? Peter and 119 other people got close to Jesus in that upper room. And they, played, they prayed for pure hearts. You can read about it in Acts chapter 5. Talks about them going everywhere, talking, preaching the word. And this was not selfish witnessing. It was early rain witnessing. An angel speaks to Philip. He says, rise and go to Gaza, south of Jerusalem, into the desert. And he arose and went. I don't know how hard it was, was to catch up with a chariot. Perhaps they were just ambling along, but he was taken there. The former rain will make people flexible and mobile and caring, okay? Won't it do that? Yes. And he found the Ethiopian, a man of royalty, riding in a chariot, reading, the, a scroll, reading from the scroll of the prophet Isaiah. And Peter comes up to him and he says, do you understand what you're reading? And uh, Philip preached Jesus from the scripture. You know, the only scripture that Philip had was the Old Testament. The Old Testament is all about Jesus, right? Bible teaching is important. That's how we receive the former rain. 
pretty soon, he said, see, here's water. And Philip baptized him on the way to Egypt. And then there were gospel. Gospel preaching was accompanied with all kinds of miracles in the first century. You know, we're all Sabbath keepers. There were Sabbath keepers in Ethiopia until recently. Ethiopia had Sabbath keepers for hundreds of years. It was one of those places. Perhaps this uh, man that Philip, baptized, or that Philip baptized had a part in all of that. And then Philip is gone. The Bible says the Spirit caught away Philip on another errand to Ashdod. We don't know how he got there. The Spirit caught away Philip. Perhaps he went flying without a license. I don't know how he got there. So it says the Spirit carried him away. That's early reign power. That happened in the first century. God is waiting for the manifestation of himself in his people so that he can work those kind of things in his people. Sitting for his portrait. Jesus sits for his portrait in every one of us. And uh, we don't want to disappoint him. Isaiah 61 to 3. I'd like to have you look at this one. Isaiah chapter 61 to 3. Isaiah, just about halfway through the Bible. Isaiah 60, 1 to 3. One of those large prophets. Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel. Isaiah 60, 1 to 3. I just love the words in this verse, this passage. Isaiah 60, 1 to 3. I'd like to have you see this with me. It says, Arise and shine, for your light has come, and the glory of the Lord has risen upon you. For behold, the darkness will cover the earth, and gross darkness the people, but the Lord shall arise upon you, <clears throat> and his glory shall be seen upon you. You remember we were reading about the Holy Spirit, tongues of fire, landing on the people that were in that upper room that day? And you know, it wasn't very long, and the Holy Spirit was abiding in them and through them to the world around them. That's what the Holy Spirit does. And the Gentiles shall come to your light, and kings to the brightness of your rising. Royalty, even kings, will come when the church is on fire. How many of you remember the name Adlai Esteb? You have to be an old Adventist to know that name. He was an Adventist poet. And he wrote a poem one time. I don't have the poem before me. I'll tell you what the poem said. Two geese were watching a jet plane going through the sky. <clears throat> and they had a plume of plume behind the behind that airliner. Okay. One goose said to the other one, sure wish I could fly like that. To which the other goose replied, you could, if your tail was on fire like his is. <laughs> Talking about fire here. The final community of saints keep God's commandments, have the faith of Jesus, and they have the testimony of Jesus. Testimony means witness. That's how they witness. They are obedient, full of faith. They witness for Jesus. That's former rain power. I long to see it happen again, and it will, and it can. This is what happens to people who get a vision of Jesus. That's the Holy Spirit. Primary work, primary work is to show us Jesus. We won't take the time to turn to that passage, but John 16, 13 to 15. I know some of you are taking notes. John 16, 13 to 15 says that the Holy Spirit is the great shower of Jesus. That's probably his primary work. To show us Jesus, the lovely Jesus who gave himself for us. And the more we pray for the Holy Spirit, Lord, we need to pray, Lord, fill me with your spirit so we get a fresh vision of Jesus today. So that we can have, so that, we can have that, uh, that wonderful former reign experience. The Holy Spirit is the great shower of Jesus. People see the gospel and they want to be baptized. And identify with Jesus. Their hearts are filled with joy. With a joy of forgiveness. And obedience. That's why people are baptized. They get a glimpse of Jesus. They want to be baptized. That's what happened to the Ethiopian man. That was riding in the chariot. Now there's a text in the Bible. A passage that's in Romans chapter 6. It describes what baptism is about. Romans chapter 6. Verses 3 to 6. When we see a baptism. We're really actually seeing a replay 
of the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. It should fill our hearts with joy as we think of it. Notice verse 3. Therefore, we are buried with him by baptism into death. It signifies the death of the old and revival of the new nature that God wants to give us, even the divine nature that's talked about in 1 Peter. Like that as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in what? Newness of life, the resurrection life, a new life. For if we have been planted together in the likeness of his death, we shall be also in the likeness of his resurrection. Knowing this, that the old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed, and hereafter we should not, see, we should not serve sin. See how clearly Jesus identifies with newborn believers who are baptized. Wow. The new birth. New life ensues. The resurrection life. What about us? Many of us have been baptized here today. Has the marriage kind of settled down into a lukewarm state? Or are we still excited about being such, having such a close connection with Jesus every day? I'm reminded of Psalm 6111, in thy presence is the fullness of joy. At thy right hand are pleasures forevermore. That can be the, the experience of that new life. I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ lives in me. That's the work of the former reign. That's sanctification. We sing, joyful, joyful, we adore thee. Remember that song? Oh, I just love the song. The fruit of all this is a new life in Christ, the resurrection life. And we can celebrate the resurrection every day when we get up in the morning. Give your heart to God in the morning. Make that your very, very first work. And uh, God will imbue you with a life that will take you through the day. All this is former rain. The Gentiles will come. And even the heathen, Psalms 2 verse 8 says, I will give you the heathen for your inheritance. Even the heathen. The devil says, not on my watch. You're not going to have these people, they're mine. But the day will come when God will have a people that are sealed very, very fully with the former rain experience. As it mentions in Ephesians 4.30. Grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby ye are sealed unto the day of redemption. God wants to seal us with that former rain seal so that the latter rain can come and seal us with the end time seal for eternity. So let's not diminish the power of the former rain. And when the Holy Spirit uh, accomplishes that work in our hearts, uh, there will be, a, there will be such, a, such showers will fall, and uh, it'll prepare the wor world for the, former, for, the, for the latter rain. You know, God is a skillful husbandman, and he know, knows exactly how much rain and heat to mature the seeds that have been affected, that have grown because of the former rain. He knows just how much. The apostles prayed and prepared for the, for the former rain, and the same work must be done now. We believe we're in the, close, in the midst of the closing scenes of Earth's history. Self must die. Regeneration and growth commence every morning. Give yourself to God in the morning. The morning is the best time to do this. Then power will come. And even signs and wonders will follow the believers. The work will be finished with not less power, than in the first century. It will come on the heels of revival and reformation, our greatest need. When Satan sees this about to happen, what do you think the devil does when he sees a revival and reformation begin to happen among God's people? When he sees that the church gets a hold of something good, what do you think he's going to do? <laughs> he explodes with the counterfeit power. Revelation 13, fire from heaven, a false revival. Um, the world will be filled with wonder. False miracles will be wrought. Sick apparently healed. And these counterfeits will be most difficult to distinguish from the true. 
I believe that the false latter rain is going to fall before the true one. And uh, it's going to be very deceptive. And those who perform these miracles will look like the genuine article, while at the same time they're trampling on God's holy law. This can be a test for us. You know, the Bible, Jesus said that even the very elect would be in danger of being deceived. That's how, how the deceptions will be. You won't be able to believe your eyes and ears when you see some of these things. And uh, Ellen White has said that these acts of apparent healings will bring Seventh-day Adventists to the test. That's a powerful statement. You know that? So for us, allow the former rain to do its work so that the latter rain can come and mature the seed. Jesus is coming. The harvest will be composed of Sabbath keepers by the grace of God. The great seal of God's law. It says in Isaiah 8 verse 16, Seal the law among my disciples. Seal it where? In the mind, in the heart. All this will be accompanied by a great test, which will bring on a time of trouble such as never was since there was a nation. This is the heat that hardens the seed as the latter rain falls. The heat. You know, uh, before harvest time, there's a period of heat. And the grain goes from the dough stage when you can, when you can, press the kernel and it kind of squeezes out, that's the dough stage. But then the latter rain comes and fills out those seeds and then the heat comes, the heat of trouble in, a, in our situation. And it hardens the grain, ready for the harvest. Do you know the mark of the beast will be our urged upon the inhabitants of the earth? Jesus said, be ready. It's a day by day experience with Jesus, submitting ourselves to his spirit. The symbolic, the symbolic entrance to all of this is baptism. Notice what accompanies baptism. And this will be our last text. Acts chapter 2, verse 38. This is what accompanies baptism. And those that are being baptized today and those of us who have been baptized, let's realize that this is something real. Acts chapter 2, verse 38. This is in Peter's... Pentecostal sermon, Acts 2, verse 38. It says, and Peter said to them, repent and be baptized. Then what does it say next? Every one of you, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and you, sh what is the next word? Shall. shall, that's a very positive word, isn't it? You shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. And then in Acts 3.19, it talks about just before the second coming of Christ, the latter rain falls, the refreshing coming from the presence of the Lord. And we can expect the latter rain when the former rain has done its work.